Okay, um, we're going to do a few, um, <clears throat> cover a few things on early Earth atmosphere. Uh, basic topics in this talk will be what Earth is made of, the provenance of Earth, the timing of volatile and atmophile accretion, define the words volatile and atmophile. Um, then we'll move into impact processing of atmospheres. This is uh, new stuff and I'm finding it quite interesting. Uh, it'll be mostly interested in the creation and photochemical evolution of Miller-Urey atmospheres. And uh, I'll have to tell you what mineral buffers are. And then um, we'll finish up with a little bit of xenon and hydrogen escape if I talk fast enough because I like xenon a lot. Well, let's begin with the beginning of um, geochemistry, which is Victor Goldschmidt's geochemical classification of the elements. This is like educational corner here. He divided elements into five categories, and an element can be in more than one category. This is noble gases, of course, are always atmophiles, but everybody else can pretty much be under things. Siderophiles are iron loving, and it refers to elements that prefer to live in cores, metals. Lithophiles are rock loving elements, and these are the elements that like to live in mantles, and they make silicate rocks. They're also called oxyphiles because these are the elements that make refractory oxi uh, oxides, oxides that are hard to volatize. We'll define refractory and volatile as well in a succeeding graph. Um, the calcophiles are sulfur loving and uh, refers to elements uh, to consign to hell. A lot of these elements are geochemical volatiles, uh, things like cadmium and stuff that basically uh, they come, the EPA comes to take them away. Um, Atmophiles are air loving. Uh, this is not widely used. Uh, it's kind of dropped out of favor and I don't really know why because it's a technically useful term and I'm going to use it. Um, we could call it xenophile, but that would be describing me and not the president. Biophile, who knew? <laughs> I've never seen it used, um, but it seems ready made for astrobiology and I think that we should try to get biophiles back as the fifth category of geochemical elements. Um, Goldschmidt listed, among other biophiles, vanadium. Yeah, <laughs> I have no idea. Okay, uh, another axis is volatility. Some things can be easy to evaporate or they can be hard to evaporate. This is called refractory and volatile. Now on this graphic here, on the, on the x-axis, we got cosmic abundances. So that's how much stuff of this, how much of this stuff is in the universe. The squiggly line was my first attempt to use some Microsoft draw feature. And uh, the y-axis is temperature. Uh, very, very hard, very, very refractory things. Graphite's the most refractory thing of all. Uh, so that high-end bicycle you have will not evaporate easily. Uh, <laughs> calcium, titanium, aluminum oxides, uh, also known as CAIs, are also very refractory. There's a lot of iron and magnesium in the universe. The universe likes making those things. It makes, likes making silicon too. So iron and magnesium silicates by accident have roughly the same temperature at which they evaporate. So this makes a nice dividing line between elements that would be called refractory when people are using the adjective as a noun or volatile when they're using the adjective as a noun would be things that are more volatile than iron or magnesium silicates. And those include things like potassium, sodium, indium, mercury, sulfur, a triolite is an iron sulfide, organics, most organics. Um, and then as we move down the temperature scale, we get ices. And eventually we get the hydrogen, helium, and neon, which never condense at all. So this gets made into a standard solar nebula. So this is your standard solar nebula. The sun's on the left, distance from the sun, heading out towards Pluto and beyond on the right. And the abundance of solids is just sort of a drawn in here with a little curve. Uh, there's a lot of rocks down towards the sun and tars made from organics. Uh, there's a snow line. Water behaves like an element. It doesn't behave in a complicated way. It just freezes out at a particular temperature. Then there's colder ices that may form another snow line. People talk about CO2 so snow lines. Then go further out from the sun. You have even colder ices. Then there might be a carbon monoxide or a methane snow line further away from the sun in this solar nebula. Did it change? No. 
Okay, we'll go on. Um, Earth did not gravitationally capture its atmophiles from a solar nebula, that's a basic point. The solar nitrogen to neon ratio is roughly unity. On Earth, that ratio is 10 to the five. So this means that Earth's atmosphere was not just simply grabbed out of the solar nebula and placed here. Uh, but there's more. Um, the neon in air is not solar. It's actually from meteorites. It has a distinct isotopic fingerprint. It is meteoritic neon. There is a little bit of solar neon in the mantle that's been found by intrepid geochemists investigating rocks from St. Paul and places like that. Uh, and it's less than a percent of Earth's neon. So the, sol the nitrogen to solar neon ratio is at least a factor of 10 to the seven. So the conclusion is that Earth accreted 100, let's see, that's 100 parts per billion of its nitrogen and hydrogen directly from the nebula and other atmospheres. So that's a basic point that's been known for a long time. It's worth bringing this up because a lot of exoplanets seem to have gravitationally captured nebulae. And in our own solar system, there are Jupiter and Saturn, which clearly did the same thing. It's certainly possible to gravitationally capture an, an, a, neb, a nebular atmosphere, but Earth does not bear any, has very little evidence of that. Probably somewhere along the line, one planetesimal or two planetesimals Earth's made from got a little because we do have a little bit of solar and noble gases in our, in our system. We have some helium, we have some neon, but it's tiny. Uh, so this is the foundation of the standard gas-free end body accretion models, which is that there's no gas. So you're gonna make Earth without the gas around. Uh, in the 80s and 90s, there were these ABC geochemical models for Earth based on that solar nebula. There's the solar nebula sitting right there with its um, different materials. Uh, the ABC model, Venke and Ringwood both, I think they called A and B differently, but that doesn't matter. 85% of it is this early stuff, rocky stuff, dry stuff, volatile free stuff, and mostly recretes early. Component B is 15% of Earth's mass, mostly accretes late, contains a fair amount of even carbonaceous chondritic type materials organics and other volatiles. And then there's this little bit at the end, a half a percent called the late veneer or component C, which taps into the very distant parts of the solar nebula. And this all makes sense, right? Things that are nearby will be the first things to accrete. Things which are further away will be the last things to accrete, sort of obvious. And so that was the model uh, based on geochemistry of the 70s and 80s and 90s. So let's get back to this. Component C, the late veneer. I'm gonna go through these highly sidereal ele siderophile elements several times. Now you heard the word siderophile, iron loving. Highly siderophile means really iron loving. Sometimes they call them extremely siderophile. Um, and there are seven elements, also known as the noble metals, ruthenium, rhodium, palladium, osmium, iridium, platinum, misspelled here is praseodymium, but it should be a T there. PR, at PR is not, it's platinum, and gold, because any group of noble metals has to include gold, as any priest or nobility would tell you. These all go very deep, strongly into metallic phases. They're found in Earth's mantle at half a percent of their cosmic abundance. Their cosmic abundance is known from abundance in things like carbonaceous chondrites, which democratically captured the stuff from which things were made in the solar system. Uh, the implication is that they were stranded in the mantle by a late impact or late impacts. And this has been accepted by almost everybody. I know a couple of um, people who don't accept it, but it's been accepted by almost everybody for decades. Uh, component C in the ABC models is, this, is based on this stuff. But you bring in the rest of the periodic table along with the ruthenium to get that half a percent of Earth's mass. Half a percent of Earth's mass is big. It's like 40% um, the mass of the moon. It's a big impactor if you do as a single body. So kind of a textbook story is that the atmophiles were all initially inside the Earth. So they were in these component Bs and component C things and they were put into the Earth as solids and then they degassed, which means volcanoes belched them forth. Um, so on this plot, we have time running from left to right. 
which is my favorite way to do time. Um, quantity going from small to high as you go up, that's my favorite way to do quantity. Um, so early on you had ne the nebula, which you can barely see, it's just really fading there. But we don't care about it, we got rid of it. Because we're not, we don't have any neon, we don't have any helium, we don't have the nebula here at Earth, so we're not gonna worry about it. In this model, the water degasses from the mantle and emerges to become the water at the surface. So that's a, that's a, that's a textbook story. You saw it a lot in geochemistry. Um, step two with the, high, the highly siderophile elements. In the historic late veneer models, component C is presumed to resemble the most atmophile rich carbonaceous chondritic material, a category known as CI chondrites. These are things packed with like 20% water by mass. The water is as um, hydrated minerals, often five, three to five, three to 10 percent carbon even. Um, with this assumption, component C will deliver a rough match to the water, CO2, and nitrogen inventories of Earth, sulfur as well. So you look at the total amount of water, carbon, and nitrogen on Earth, and it's roughly what you would get if, a, if you took half a percent of Earth's mass as carbonaceous chondrites and dropped it on the Earth in as a component C. So with that story, we, we create a neo-traditional late veneer model. And Francois Albered went the furthest, Francis Albered went the furthest with this. Um, he just made Earth completely volatile free and then adds the volatile late with the component C late veneer. And because he's a geochemist, he puts them in the ground first and then they have to degas because that's what they do in geochemistry. Um, on the bottom there, we got the hydrocytophile elements there. They're sitting at their half. Um, a digression, meteorites, because I didn't, I've been using these technical words for meteorites. They're classified by morphology and mineralogy and a whole bunch of other things, and it's hard, and I wouldn't recommend you going off and doing this to begin with. But there are certain broad brush categories. There are iron meteorites. They are iron. You, those are the things you think of. Cape York meteorite at uh, Hayden Planetarium, right? That's a proper meteorite. Um, the achondrites, these are meteorites that are, come from the silicates from melted differentiated bodies. So they come from little planets or possibly big planets, but they're planets that have evolved a core and a mantle. And these achondrites come from the mantle part. And then we got chondrites. And these things come from bodies that did not differentiate. So there's, they're probably small bodies or from the surface of bodies. Um, and they're usually made of chondrules, which are these little sand sized or smaller particles, sort of like sandstones very weird and a deep puzzle that's been going on for half a century and nobody has a clue how they get made as far as I can tell. We got three kinds of chondrites, ordinary, enstatite, the weird stuff, we're gonna go back to enstatite chondrites a lot, and carbonaceous chondrites because these have the carbon in the water. So the new thing now, what all the cool people do is they divide meteorites by isotopes. So now they got carbon, carbonaceous chondrite-like and not carbonaceous chondrite-like isotopes. I love it. It's all that classification scheme. I don't have to learn it. I, this is just two pow, pools to put things in. I got the NCs and I got the CCs. Slacker's reward. Um, it applies to planets as well as meteorites, so it's very, very powerful. And it's turned up some excellent surprises. Here's a kind of a graphic. I just took a random one from a pot paper by Scott et al. Uh, the actual discovery was by Paul Warren in 2011, when he discovered that the solar system isotopes were sorting into two camps. This is from 2018. On, one, on this one has oxygen isotopes and chromium isotopes, but you can do this with a lot of other elements as well. And you break into these two categories, the NC category and the CC category. The, um, there's a gap, mind the gap. The gap may record the gap opened by Jupiter between different parts of the solar system. That is certainly the received wisdom as of 2019. And uh, that's tied into the grand tack theory that Sean talked to you about. Uh, the CC category forms this big area and then there's that big area of, surrounded in red called the NC category. Uh, Earth, Moon, and Encetite chondrites are all found in a little corner, just this little bit, little corner of the NC space. Well, that's kind of interesting. Uh, 
And Mars and the Albrights, which are the Enstatite chondrites, all sit right in there, right nearby. And so the suggestion is that Earth, Moon, Mars, all these things are actually made from a distinct inner solar system material. It is not all of the NC space, but it's just a little corner of the NC space. So this led um, Dofa to create his, a new ABC model. He actually uses one, two, and three Roman numerals. Um, but I like to use A prime, B prime, C prime to because he's copying the old three uh, phase models. Um, but he's doing it with isotopes. And he has two versions of this. One, he includes the element neodymium in his thinking, and the other one, he excludes neodymium. The problem with neodymium is that it is, um, has a radioactive, two radioactive parents in samarium, 146 and 147. The advantage of concluding neodymium is that it's obsessively studied and measured because it has two radioactive parents. Um, then there's a component B prime, which you can again work out with or without the neodymium. And then the C prime is the same as the old C from the ABC models. But they come from different places. Um, in this model, there's the gap. We have the NC stuff with the E type, the encetite chondrite stuff. And we got the CC stuff in the outer solar system and the other side is Jupiter. So in this model, um, C prime plays the same, what the, yeah, the error, the errors tell you where they're coming from. I wanted to say that. Um, in the A prime, B prime, C prime model, it's the A prime stuff, the first stuff to accrete that comes from furthest away. And the last stuff to accrete, the C prime, is the stuff that comes from closest to Earth. That's kind of counterintuitive, but that's what the isotopic data tell you. So that that late veneer is actually nearby stuff. It's not from distant, and distant parts of the solar system. Our contributions from the distant solar system are actually in the first half of Earth's accretion. Uh, uh, the C prime component plays the same rate, role as component C did in the traditional geochemistry. Uh, because component C prime resembles encetichondrites, bobrites, and type 1AB iron meteorites, none of them have any water or significant amounts of water. But they are rich in other atmophiles and volatiles. This is a plot of that. You look at an encetichondrite, this is divided by Earth's bulk abundance. So if something's 200 times Earth's bulk abundance, you can take a half a percent of Earth's, atmos of Earth's mass of that material and create the entire terrestrial inventory. The encetite chondrite veneer, if that's what it was, would supply all of Earth's nitrogen as a late veneer. And there's lots of carbon too, it's in the form of graphite. The nitrogen is cool because it's in these um, minerals that no, I know you've never heard of, uh, titanium nitride and sinoite, a silicon nitride. You've seen titanium nitride, though, because uh, it's used as a drill bit coating. It's a goldish coating. So when you go to the hardware store and you see a drill bit with this goldish coating, it's got titanium nitrate on it. They've even got, amphetites even have lots and lots of argon and xenon. So they have noble gases, too. But they don't have water. They're dry. So you can't make Earth's oceans this way. If we're going to make extreme close-up now, Greenwood et al. put this paper out in 2018 where they do this extreme close-up in on the Earth and the Moon. And they've, these are different axes than I've shown before. The little delta O18 on the x-axis is mass fractionation, and the cap delta O17 is the third isotope. It's the mass-independent fractionation. Um, we've blown up that little bit of the NC space that, sit, that sits around the encetite chondrites. And we're looking at the blue, the blue field are the high iron encetite chondrites, the EL field are the low iron encetite chondrites, deep inside are the aubrites, and, which are the encetite achondrites, the encetites that came from a planet, and um, the earth and the moon, which are nearly but not exactly identical in oxygen isotopes. So we make a story Taking this into account, we follow that, that argument from Greenwood. Most of the water predates the moon-forming impact. 
on Earth. The moon forming impact occurs, then the water begins to dwindle from impact after impact. You will note that I've added methane now to the plot. That's foreshadowing. We will come back to that. Um, and this is the not, that's a non-traditional late veneer. Uh, latest thing to come up was molybdenum. And now something new has happened that they've, that attempts have been made to move Earth off the NC population and give it some CC components. And so that's what that blue um, Earth symbol means is that uh, uh, Buddha et al. have moved the Earth. And that is literally what they did. They have redefined the, um, the composition of the Earth. And they didn't change the compositions of the meteorites. So now Earth appears on bulk to have a significant amount of CC in it, but it's not light. It's not the highly siderophile elements in the light veneer, and it's not, in their case, it is the Thea impact, but I don't think they're right about that. They actually, in their paper, in one of the uh, tabloids, said that um, if the CC molly that they see any of any of a decide here, any of you ever heard of Mitch Ryder and Detroit Reels? There was a song that they combined uh, CC Ryder and Good Golly Miss Molly. And so CC Molly will never, ever be forgotten by me. Um, so Buddha et al. interprets CC Molly as the signature of Thea. And so they're claiming that Thea has a big carbonaceous chondritic component in it. Thea is the object that strikes the earth to make the moon. Uh, and if they're right, then the HSCs, the highly siderophile element event, the component C event, is a real thing. Uh, but if uh, Earth CC Molly predates the Thea impact, the highly siderophile elements could be from Thea and Earth and would predate the Thea impact. And so I think that's another one to go. Oh, yes. Number six, I think I just repeated that. What was I talking about? I was talking about this one because I saw it. I'm sorry. Don't worry about it. <laughs> this is going a little fast anyway. Uh, this is the Buddha et al. story. They have all the water coming in with the moon forming impact. And so that blue shading starts with the moon forming impact. And Earth before then was devoid of water. And then they have the um, component C impact, the late veneer impact. Um, supplying the um, highly siderophile elements to the mantle. Uh, Norm Sleep doesn't buy the existence of a highly siderophile element impact. He doesn't buy the componency impact at all. He thinks that all of the highly siderophile elements were delivered by the moon forming impact itself. So if you were to put it up, if you were to put it together that way, you would get this story where the water predates the moon forming impact and then dwindles over time as escape occurs. Does an, HS, does an HSC event, does a component C event really matter? Uh, and, and yes, in a way it does. If it happens, it delivers enough iron to reduce two oceans of water to hydrogen. That's quite a lot of reducing power. And this can leave the mantle reduced for a considerable time if there was more water, if there was less water than two oceans. If you had more than two oceans, you might have exhausted it. Uh, but it may not be directly important unless it's the last Earth sterilizing impact. Because now we're interested in life, right? This is astrobiology after all. And unless it's the last of the Earth sterilizing impacts, this particular impact wouldn't be important. What are the chances that it's the last one? Probably about one in six or one in eight. So it's not small, but it's improbable. The last sterilizing impact was probably more in the range of Vesta or Ceres. And there's a picture of a potential hazardous impact. So what happens with these things? I wanted to get into the atmospheres. Uh, Schaefer and Fegley published a bunch of curves and bunch of models in 2007 to 2009, continuing up into 2017 and beyond. Uh, Hashimoto et al. published a similar paper in 2007 that Bruce was very upset about because it was the same time as his, um, doing the same thing. But what they do is they compute uh, equilibrium abundances of an interesting atmophilic elements for um, 
meteoritic buffers. So they imagine that the gases uh, in, that are degassed from the impactor are determined by the mineral buffer. We'll get to that, mineral buffers next. The mineral buffer of the meteorites. And if you do that, you get these black curves they have. And I've added the quench points. Is that where does the meth, where does the reaction that makes methane stop happening? So you make a hot plume of gas starting on the right, and time will evolve from right to left. This is not the direction I like to do time. So time going from right to left as the as the parcel of gas cools. First, it hits the ammonia quench point. So you see that ammonia got quenched at 10 to the minus three mole fraction. So that's not a huge amount of ammonia, but there's some in this atmosphere. And then when methane gets quenched at about 720 Kelvin, all your carbon and all of your hydrogen are in methane. There's no water, there's nothing but methane. You've converted the entire atmosphere to methane. So now he, this is a particularly good buffer for making methane, the QFI buffer, it's very favorable, but it's an interesting thing to think about. So we'll consider three kinds of mineral buffers, and these will be important when there's more rock than atmosphere to interact with, because then the mineral buffer gets to tell the atmosphere what it will be. If you have more atmosphere than mineral buffer, then the mineral buffer gets told what to do by the atmosphere. So we have these three popular buffers in the business, QFM, quartz phthalite magnetite, and the, it's a reaction between quartz and magnetite on one side and phthalite, which is part of olivine, a common mineral of earth, and oxygen. This determines the oxygen abundance. There's another one called the iron wistite buffer. This is more reduced because this involves metallic iron and oxidation of, and then there was the QFI which is a, the buffer that most accurately approximates ordinary anisotite chondrites. And that's one involves silica, metallic iron, um, and um, the phthalite. For, for the bottom line with these buffers is what they do at magma temperatures. The QFM buffer, which is what dominates volcanic gases today and the mantle today, the hydrogen the water ratio is about 1 to 50, and the carbon monoxide to carbon dioxide ratio is about 1 to 30. So the gases that come out of volcanoes are CO2 and water. The iron wustite buffer at magma temperature is about 1 to 1, about equal amounts of hydrogen and water, equal amounts of carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. And the QFI buffer favors hydrogen over water, and it favors carbon monoxide over CO2, but very easily tips over to favor methane if the uh, temperature is a little lower or if the pressures are high. So we're gonna do a model thermochemistry now. We're gonna just do this. We're gonna compute equilibria with an iron wistite buffer until the iron is exhausted and this buffer will control the oxygen in the atmosphere and thereafter compute the equilibria with oxygen conserved. The cooling is set by how long it takes to radiate the heat of the atmosphere. If you evaporate ocean of water, you have 300 bars of steam. It takes 1,000 years for 300 bars of steam to cool. So that sets your time scale. And then you use that to determine the quench point of the gas. And that will tell you from the kinetics of the hydrogen, water, methane, carbon monoxide system what the quenched composition will be. So just as an example, we'll take the component C, maximum highly siderophile element impact, and ask what do we get? And what we get, this is what the iron wistite buffer, not as favorable. All the carbon goes to methane. Half the, the there's still water and there's still hydrogen. Ammonia is, an, is a surprising visitor and shows up uh, pretty much, most of the nitrogen ends up in ammonia as well. Um, no, that's not right. About 30% of the nitrogen ends up in ammonia. Carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide are the losers. Now you may ask, well, why are we using 500 bars of water and 100 bars of CO2? That's huge pressure. That's what favors the methane. That's what favors the, the ammonia. And the reason is atmospheric inventories of other planets. Venus has 90 bars of CO2. Um, Earth's atmosphere doesn't have much CO2 yet. We're working on it. Um, 
but the crust has 50 bars of CO2 and the mantle's got between 70 and 200, pretty uncertain, but there's a lot down there. Um, water, the same kind of thing goes on. The oceans are about 270 bars and the mantle may have 100 to 500 bars of water, not very well known. Uh, so 100 bars of CO2 just presumes that the previous evolution of the atmosphere had produced an oxidized mantle at the QFM buffer, and then it splits the CO2 about equally between the magma ocean, which is, of course, a favorite thing to have, and, and the atmosphere. So the 100 bar number has been pretty popular. As to the 500 bars of water, I have to get rid of, I'm going to find a lot of hydrogen escape is necessary. That's on the low side. Uh, just do a Vesta impact, which is the scale I think that's best. This also produces methane. If you look at the quench point on the right there, you'll see that about two thirds of the carbon ended up as methane. About a third of the carbon ended up as methane, two thirds of CO2. Uh, I tried 20 bars atmosphere. And what you see is that as a cutoff in impactor sizes, the 10 to the 23 size is basically a smallish Vesta. And it's about the minimum impact that can vaporize the oceans. If the impact is not big enough to vapor the oceans, no methane. That's a necessity. The oceans have to be fully evaporated to get into the methane regime. And now you're thinking, uh, life didn't get through that, did it? And no, it probably didn't. So it's, you're only going to get one shot at this, basically. You're going to get the last ocean vaporizing impact. And that's the one you're going to have to make your life in, because that's your one shot. Also did these with one bar. It's the same kind of thing. Uh, now we're going to evolve the atmospheres. Uh, the, the atmospheres are going to evolve using methane photolysis to make organic hazes and tars. We're going to make um, hydrogen cyanide and nitriles from ammonia, I mean, from methane and nitrogen. We're going to oxidize methane from CO2 and water. Hydrogen will escape and tars, will, organic materials, will precipitate. Water is mostly condensed. It's in the oceans. The wetter the atmosphere, the more oxidized things are. And then just run this until the methane is gone. So here's the picture. Impact occurs. Convert your atmosphere to something with a lot of methane in it. Now what happens when you sign the sun on it? And so what happens at first is the nitrogen breaks in the nitrogen atoms and they react with um, pieces of methane that were broken up by Lyman alpha photons to make nitriles, hydrogen cyanide, tars, Hydrogen escapes. You can see that it's nice and dark up there with the organic haze. Uh, then the next, a little bit later, as the CO2 starts to build up, it becomes more oxidized. And then CO2 starts making oxygen atoms. The oxygens will react with hydrogens. You get OHs. They can compete and kind of shut off your hydrogen cyanide formation. On the other hand, they also compete to make um, uh, carbon monoxide and ultimately carbon dioxide instead of tars. So as the amount of methane goes away, eventually the atmosphere switches into a highly oxidized regime in which the haze vanishes. So the schematic evolution of one of these, um, at first the methane builds up because it's got time to, and then it starts being attacked by ultraviolet and the right-hand panel it is removed slowly. This is a very large impact. It started with 100 bars of methane. So it took 60, 55 million years to get rid of the methane at a very high EUV level, appropriate for the early sun. Uh, the haze lasted for about 55 million years in this case. So you got like a titan looking earth that lasted for 50 million years after this impact. Uh, throughout this time, you're making nitriles. Eventually, once the um, this, the methane photochemical system switched into making CO2 instead of hazes, things clear up and, CO, and carbon monoxide dwindles and CO2 grows. In this particular case, this is a very productive one. I'm showing this one because it's so productive in a sense. It took 100 bars of methane and it made 50 bars of tar. So I don't know how thick that is, but it's, it's kilometers, I'm sure of tars. So this is not the primordial oil slick anymore. It's more like the, the um, primordial tar dump, the 
the La Brea tar pits of, of the earth. So you just go down on Wilshire Boulevard and see the early earth in action. Um, it also lost uh, uh, 300 bars of hydrogen, a full ocean's worth of hydrogen escaped in the 50 million years that this system evolved. Uh, you can do a smaller impact, and it's not quite as outrageous. An impact in the series size will lose about 20 bars of hydrogen. The tar will be a, makes about a bar of tar. After the Vesta event, the Vesta event only lasted uh, half a million years as a methane atmosphere, and then the haze goes away. In this particular case, the hydrogen cyanide continues to get made for a little while after the haze has stopped getting made because there's, there's different reaction schemes. Hydrogen cyanide depends on methane and nitrogen, while, while hazes require methane and methane. So uh, you can still, can still get methane moving over to hydrogen cyanide after it's not, no longer making a haze. Hydrogen, in this case, lasted for one and a half million years. What does that time mean? Two more minutes. That's what nine means. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, two minutes for xenon escape. Why not? You're not going to get much. Xenon preserves a record of ancient hydrogen escape. It's more easily ionized than hydrogen, and therefore it can escape as an ion, and no other noble gas can. Here are the data. Um, xenon, krypton isotopes are normalized to the solar wind. Here on the right hand, on the right you see xenon, krypton is at around mass 84, xenon's over at about 130. Uh, you compare, uh, if you look at Earth and Mars, you see that they are, the xenon isotopes are strongly, profoundly mass fractionated. This is a very steep hill. You would need a runaway truck lane if you were to go down this. Uh, and it's depleted. There's not as much xenon as there should be compared to potential sources. So the implication is that it's missing, it's fractionated, the xenon escape. Um, if you look at the isotopes in detail, you see that they have changed over time. I'll show it here. The total amount of xenon fractionation has been a function of time. This is work done by Pahol, Avis, Marti, the group in France. And on the right-hand axis, we have the age of the samples. So uh, four and a half billion years ago is the origin of the Earth, and that's down here in the corner. And over the course of the first two, two and a half billion years of Earth's history, the xenon fractionated. So it didn't start off fractionated. It became fractionated over the course of atmospheric evolution. The uh, half of that's in the Hadean. So the hydrogen escape doesn't just in the Archean of Earth, it's also in the Hadean of Earth. Uh, we built a model to, to account for xenon escape. The model only works if there is enough hydrogen in the atmosphere and the sun is a strong enough EUV source. The strength of the EUV source is quite normal for the Hadean Earth, but a little high for the Archean Earth. The hydrogen mixing ratio, not a, not a number of bars, but just mixing ratio, is around 10%. So these are very hydrogen-rich atmospheres that are required if xenon is to escape as an ion in a particular model. So review of part two told as a narrative example. We'll just go through an impact. We have rock vapor. It, the temperature is dropping. We, the water is coming, exalving from the mantle. Hydrogen is cr being created by mineral buffers. Methane is growing as the thing cools. We go through a very brief interval where the methane leaps up to the full 100 bars. The steam begins to condense and forms condensed oceans of water. You have a beginning the epoch of organic hazes. Ammonia appears, but already begins to photolyze or rain out. And then we walk through the end to the next tens of millions of years as the, um, the methane is destroyed. It's replaced by CO2. Then eventually the CO2 is subducted and you go into impact ice ages. Things become very cold. We have an artist's conception of the warm Hadean steam bath that occurs when there's 50 bars of CO2. We also have an artist's conception of what happens when the CO2 is gone. Um, we end with a vision of early Earth, the island Kerguelen, which is my 
favorite example of what early Earth might have been like. That's it for this talk. You can. Steve Benner announces that he can date the origin of life to plus or minus 15 million years. Question. <laughs> yeah, that's this one. Be after. That's correct. Steve Benner points out that the smaller impact gives you less time to create the origin of life, and that is true. <clears throat> no. You have, you have um, in a typical population of impactors, you might have a half a dozen Vestas that struck Earth during its entire late veneer period. So the, the big one could have been the last one. I don't know which one to pick, but there is a last one, and that's the one you have to use, because the ones before that, um, all their good work is wasted. No. You're right about the carbon. Carbon can do, oh, the question is, does carbon do strange things when you get to very low um, iron, uh, um, oxygen fugacities and mineral buffers? Um, and did I take that into account? The answer is I did not take it into account. And I agree, carbon is known to do strange things at low redox. It will make graphites. It, will, it can make graphites instead of methane but I didn't include the solid phase at all. Yes. I think that's where this is heading. I initially set off, oh, the question, I, don't, I can't, I can't rephrase your question. Can you, can you give me another? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes, the question is um, if, I'll rephrase it. If the last ocean vaporizing impact were a carbonaceous chondrite, would this work well? And I think the answer is it, sort, it works sort of. And the reason it will still work is even the QFM buffer will give you methane when you have a thousand bars to work with. So the thing is, if you have a lot of water to vaporize, you don't need a strongly reduced buffer to get methane. Look around you. I think we're the evidence. Oh, uh, question: How do we test the uh, <laughs> which is the um, which the order of the impacts? I think a, a non-joking answer is that I haven't thought about it yet. However, uh, the prediction of things like 50 bars of tar falling to the surface that has to lead to predictions that can be refuted. Because that that's going to get subducted, and it's, it's, it's got to just really show up as something funny if that's what happened there. If that was like the really big impact was the last one, you, that would have some consequences. It doesn't. Um, 
I wanted to go back to the to the isotopes. I yeah. Oh, yeah. Repeat the question. Um, can comets be a major contributor to the, um, I guess, the water inventory of Earth? Would that be the way to put it? Uh, and the answer is, they aren't. They just aren't. It's. Um, it could have been. In a, in a, and they might have, if they were before the moon forming impact, they certainly are free to help it. I mean, a Pl dropping a Pluto into the inner solar system at 30 million years would do wonders for the water inventories of the inner solar system. That would be a great thing to do. But after the moon forming impact, the isotopes are resolutely, invariably encitichondritic. There's no room to fit more than 3% of the mass as comets at which point you just can't bring enough water in. And there are other arguments that Bernard Marty uses with Xenon that says that it's more like a part in 10 to the three of Earth's oceans or water commentary. Robert, it's not like the, the microwave baking the near um, uh, 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 um, Yeah, yeah, there will be there will be water delivered, but it's okay. The question is, I don't like Mike Drake. No, that's not the question. <laughs> I liked Mike Drake. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, the, the question is um, again back. It's back to whether the late veneer is a good way to deliver water. I didn't even think Mike Drake thought that actually. I thought that, that he was kind of against the carbonaceous chondrite, chondrite late veneer on the grounds that the osmium isotopes didn't work. He was one of the first people that told me that there was, this was not a done deal, that that late veneer might not be as oxidized and volatile rich as you had been told. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Again, Kevin. Okay.